Welcome to the Skullamance in-depth dungeon guide for both Horde and Alliance. As always, timestamps, requests, complex trash pulls, and bosses in their respective loots can be found in the comments below. There are a large amount of pre-raid best and slot items found within this dungeon, so I'll tribute every item of note with the corresponding class and specs icon. Skullamance is an academy for necromantic arts created by Kel'Thuzad to bolster the armies of undead. The halls of the academy are infested by the Rod of the Scourge and what remains of the Baroff family, who gave their castle, crypts, and lives for the Lich King's blessing of immortality. Skullamance can be found in the southeast corner of the western Plaguelands and should be completed by everyone, not only because it has amazing items, quests, and aesthetics, but because it's the best dungeon in the game, at least in my opinion. The halls are crowded with mobs, making Skullamance one of the better places to grind out experience or gold as a group. A fair portion of the mobs within the dungeon are immune to all magic besides holy, so I can strongly recommend a paladin tank as well as a priest for damage. As always, crowd control is necessary, so bring a rogue or a mage. I'd recommend bringing an off tank as some pulls can get quite challenging as well as some bosses. But if you believe your tank is competent or has fantastic gear, this can be bypassed. The recommended levels are 57 to 60, but you can enter the dungeon as early as level 45 although I wouldn't really recommend doing so. Expect to sink in at least two hours here, but this can vary based on your group's experience. Before I jump into our quests, we'll need to create the key to enter the dungeon. Both factions will need 15 gold and two thorium bars, so make sure you have those on hand before starting the quest line. As a lions, pick up Call to Arms from Cryer Goodman and Stormwind, found patrolling throughout the city. This quest will send us to Commander Ashlam Valorfist on the border of Western Plaguelands in Alteric Mountains. Ashlam will offer us the follow-up, Clear the Way, which will require us to kill 10 Skeletal Flayers and 10 Slavering Ghouls, just to the east in Sorrow Hill. Next up, Ashlam will give us All Along the Watchtowers. This quest tasks us with marking 4 Watchtowers found in Anderhall. Stand at the door and use the torch and it should reward completion. Upon returning to Ashlam, he'll give us Skolomance, which requires you to talk to Alchemist Arbington found a few steps away. Arbington will give us Skeletal Fragments, which will require us to collect 15 Skeletal Fragments from any Skeleton mob in Anderhall. These have an 80% drop chance, so they shouldn't be too difficult to acquire. Arbington will now give us Mold Rhymes with, which sends us down to Gadgetson to speak with Crinkle Goldsteel. Make sure you have 15 gold on hand, otherwise Crinkle will turn us away. Upon paying Crinkle, he'll give us Fireplume Forged, sending us to the top of the Fireplume Volcano in the center of the Ungoro Crater. Use the Skeleton Key Mold by the Lava and create the Unfinished Key, then head back to Alchemist Arbington in Western Plaguelands. Arbington will now give us Araj's Scarab, tasking us with collecting the Signet from the Skullamance's former leader, Araj. I'd recommend doing this quest as a party, as Araj can be quite tough, especially considering all of the patrols and stationary mobs found around him in Anderhall. Turning the quest into Arbington will open up one final quest from Ashlam. Speak with him and he'll give you the Skeleton Key, granting you access to Skolomance. As Horde, in Undercity, we can pick up Call to Arms, Western Plaguelands, from Harbinger Balthazad. Head to the bulwark found in the far east of the Tirasfall Glades, on the border with Western Plaguelands, and speak with High Executioner Darrington. Darrington will give us Scarlet Diversions, which sends us into the Plaguelands to destroy a Scarlet Camp found here, and plant a banner over the burned remains. Before you walk off to do this quest, pick up the Bottle of Flame found by the crate near Darrington. Once completed, Darrington will give us All Along the Watchtowers. This quest tasks us with marking four towers found in Anderhall. Stand at the door and use the torch and it should reward completion. Upon our return, Darrington will send us a few steps away to speak with Apothecary Dithers, with the quest Skolomance. Dithers will give us Skeletal Fragments, which requires us to collect 15 Skeletal Fragments from any Skeleton mob in Anderhall. These have about an 80% drop chance, so they shouldn't be too difficult to acquire. Dithers will now give us Mold Rhymes with, which sends us down to Gadgetson to speak with Crinkle Goldsteel, Make sure you have 15 gold on hand, otherwise Crinkle will turn us away. Upon paying Crinkle, he'll give us Fireplume Forged, sending us to the top of the Fireplume Volcano in the center of the Ungoro Crater. Use the Skeleton Key Mold by the Lava and create the Unfinished Key and then head back to Alchemist Dithers in Western Plaguelands. Dithers will now give us Araj's Scarab, tasking us with collecting the Signet from the Skullmance's former leader, Araj. 
I'd recommend doing this quest as a party, as a Raj can be quite tough, especially considering all of the patrols and stationary mobs found around him in Anderhal. Turning the quest into Dithers will open up one final quest from Darrington. Speak with him and he'll give us the skeleton key, granting you access to Skolomance. Alternatively, a rogue can pick the lock if they have over 280 skill. What do you need? Strength. Both Alliance and Horde have one quest each. Starting off with Horde, we have Barov Family Fortune, given to us by Alexei Barov in the Bulwark. Alexei wants us to collect his four family deeds from the dungeon. The first can be found here, the second here, the third here, and the final one here. The follow-up quest rewards an incredible trinket, so I'd recommend everyone to do it. Just be warned, it's a bit difficult, so you might need a party. Hey there. See you around. Alliance have the same quest, but offered from Weldon Barov, who can be found in Chillwind Camp. Weldon tasks us with collecting his four family deeds from Skolomance. The first can be found here, the second here, the third here, and the final one here. The follow-up quest rewards an incredible trinket, so I'd recommend everyone to do it. Just be warned, it's a bit difficult, so bring a party. Talk to me. Right back. Our first neutral quest is quite a lengthy one, so I'd recommend starting this far before you plan on coming into the dungeon. From Tinky Steam Boil in Flamecrest, we can pick up Broodling Essence. This quest sends us to zap Welplings found all throughout the Burning Steps. Once you're done zapping, Tinky will send us up to Everlook to speak with her friend, Felnok Steelspring. After we meet with Felnok, he'll send us off to collect eight uncracked Chillwind Horns from the Chimeras found roaming all throughout Winterspring. Return to Felnok and he'll send us back to Tinky. Now we'll have to return to Everlook. Felnok will offer us a new quest sending us back to Tinky once again. At this point I'm starting to think Blizzard created this quest simply to waste our time. But anyways, we head back to Tinky because we really want this quest done. Returning to Tinky will give us a quest for the Upper Blackrock Spire. You won't have to delve too deep into the dungeon, so you might be able to get a 5 man together to quickly complete this quest. Once we reach the Rookery, use the Exiloscope prototype on any of the eggs, then head back to Tinky. At long last, Tinky will send us to Light's Hope Chapel with the quest Leonid Bartholomew. And if you haven't noticed by now, Tinky is actually working for the Scourge. Anyways, Leonid thanks us for helping him trick Tinky and sends us outside to speak with Bettina Bigglesink. Bettina will give us the final quest of the chain, Dawn's Gambit, which sends us into Skolomance and tasks us with placing down Dawn's Gambit inside of the viewing room, where the necromancers are being trained. Do not stay in the room once it's placed, as although it will kill all of the students, they'll come back as skeletons. To finish up the quest, we'll also need to take care of Vectis. Kill him, and we're all set. Continuing with Bettina, she'll also offer Plagued Hatchlings, which requires us to kill 20 of the Plagued Dragonling Hatchlings found above Rattlegore's pit. Once you turn the quest in and return to the dungeon, if you kill the Hatchlings again, they have a chance to drop a healthy Dragon Scale. Accepting the quest will send us back to Bettina for some extra experience. The remainder of our quest can be picked up in the keep outside of Skolomance's entrance. We can find the ghost of Eva Sarkov, the Barov family's head maid, by the castle. Eva gives us the quest, Dr. Theolin Krastinov the Butcher, which tasks us with killing Krastinov, the man responsible for the torture of Eva and her husband. Once he's defeated, make sure you burn Eva and her husband's remains to complete the remainder of the quest. Eva will then give us the follow-up, Krastinov's Bag of Horrors. This portion of the quest tasks us with returning to the Skolomance, killing Jandis Barov in the crypts, and returning with Krastinov's Bag of Horrors. Eva will offer us one last quest, Kirtonos the Herald. This quest will give us the opportunity to summon a secret boss early on in the dungeon. If we use the Blood of Innocence on the brazier on the balcony found in the second area, we can summon Kirtonos the Herald. Slay Kirtonos and return to Eva. Our final quest can be picked up with the trinket we received from Eva's previous quest. Equipping the Spectral Essence will reveal the ghostly denizens of Daromir, the keep around the Skolomance. You'll see Magistrate Marduk present with our final quest line, beginning with the human Raz Frost Whisper. This quest will send us a few zones down into the Arathi Highlands, where we'll be tasked with searching for the book Keepsake of Remembrance found in the various areas of Stormguard. 
Once we return to Marduk with the book, he'll give us the follow-up, The Dying, Raz Frost Whisper, sending us to Light's Hope Chapel to bring the tattered book to Leonid Bartholomew. Leonid will tell us the story of Raz, and Tassie with taking the book upon the unholy ground found within Stratholm. You'll need to complete Stratholm, which is easier said than done, and take the book to Rivendare's Crypt, where you'll be able to click on the symbol found on the ground. The symbol gives you a follow-up, which just sends you back to Leonid. Leonid will give us one final quest sending us back to Marduk with the soulbound keepsake we've just created. Marduk will finally send us back into Stratholm with the quest The Lich, Ras Frost Whisper. This quest will require us to head to Ras found inside of the dungeon, and then use the tome on him to revert him back to his human form. The channel to turn him human takes about 10 seconds, so tanks and healers should let a damage dealer handle this portion. Do this as soon as possible as he'll heal the full health once he transforms. Complete the fight as normal, and collect his head to complete the quest. As a side note, paladins and warlocks must also stop by Skullamance to complete some parts of their epic mount questline, as well as a portion of Dungeon Set 2 requiring you to kill a boss found within the dungeon. I won't cover these here as there are plenty of guides out there that cover these questlines. I'll link a few in the description if you particularly came for this information. The first boss we can encounter is the Blood Steward of Kurtonos. You'll only need to kill her after you've completed the Kurtonos questline to retrieve more blood to summon Kurtonos again. The Blood Steward is fairly easy. Often she uses Curse of Impotence and Curse of Weakness, which will afflict the target with the curse that reduces magic damage done and physical damage done respectively. The Steward's final ability is Paralyzing Poison, which will stun her primary target for 8 seconds. This can be dispelled by a druid, but if you didn't bring one, keep the tank healed up and exercise caution if she pulls off of the tank. Otherwise, she's just a simple tank and spank. Coming into the Chamber of Summoning, be careful of the summoners. Focus them down as they'll keep summoning skeletons that will eventually overwhelm you. You'll have to attack the groups on the piles. This room can be quite tough if you chain pull, so use cooldowns if necessary and focus on killing the summoners before using your area of effect spells. Upon placing the blood on the balcony brazier, Kurtonos will fly in. Kurtonos has two forms. In his human form, he is a caster. The big ability to watch out for here is mind control. Try and crowd control the target to lessen the impact of that class. Kurtonos will also cast shadow bolt volleys. Interrupt this to lessen shadow damage, but letting one or two go through will not be the end of the world. His final spell in his human form is Curse of Tongues, which will increase casting time by 50%. Immediately decurse this if it's on any casters in your party, as it will tremendously decrease damage and healing. At about 75%, Kurtonos will transform into his bat form. In bat form, Kurtonos has a brand new set of skills. You'll want to face him away from your party as he'll wing flap, knocking everyone in front of him backwards. To add on to his frontal cone abilities, he also has swoop, which will cleave as well as stun everyone in front of him for 2 seconds. Kurtonos will also disarm for 10 seconds, and pierce armor, which will reduce total armor by 50%. Pop a defensive during this time to negate some of the damage. At 25%, Kurtonos will return to his human form with the same abilities. Burn him down and you'll be rewarded with some pretty great items. In the Baroff family crypts, be careful of the Risen Apparitions as they're immune to all magic damage besides Holy. Make sure they're down before you pull more. Also, pay attention to the diseased ghouls as they explode on death, dealing damage and leaving a very painful gas cloud. Descending into the family crypts, we can encounter the first member of the Barovs, Jandis. Jandis is noted as being one of the first of the mages who could replicate herself, but we'll get to that after we discuss her first two abilities. Dark Plague, which deals contact damage, and then applies a ticking damage over time, and Curse of Blood, which increases physical damage taken by 500. Try and dispel slash decurse these, but if you can't, it's not the end of the world. What makes Jandis challenging is that she'll constantly summon illusions of herself. These illusions are immune to area damage, thus, they must be individually targeted if you want them dead. They only have about 2000 health, so it isn't too much of a hassle to kill them, but your group needs to make a tough decision here. Either focus Jandis down if the tank has cooldowns available, or each DPS needs to take responsibility for focusing down her illusions. You can't do both, or you'll most likely be overwhelmed. On the wall by Jandis, we can hit a torch that will give us access to a treasure later on in the dungeon. In the bone pits below the Welpling Room, we can encounter Rattlegore. 
For the most part, Rattlegore is a tank in Spank, but he has a Wallop. Rattlegore's most common ability is Strike, which just deals an attack with increased power. Rattlegore will also knock away, which just knocks you back a short distance. Rattlegore's final ability is War Stomp. This ability stuns everyone around him for 5 seconds and knocks back a short distance. If you can, keep your distance. Don't let Rattlegore's few abilities let you think he's easy. He hits incredibly hard. Otherwise, make sure you clear the room of all adds and focus on keeping the tank healed up, and you should have few issues. Rattlegore drops the key to the viewing room, so he must be killed to proceed. The pit before the viewing room has the same mobs as we saw in Jandis' Crypt. Be extremely careful if you're in melee range, as all of the gas hitting you at once will probably end your life. In the pit before the viewing room, if you hit the torch in Jandis' Crypt, you'll have access to a small treasure. It doesn't drop anything fantastic, so it isn't necessary to collect. Next up, we encounter a room full of up-and-coming necromancers, their teacher Vectus, and his guard, Marduk Blackpool. The students are not hostile, but if you attack Vectus, they will all turn on you. Thus, to avoid this, area of effect the students to aggro them. Proceed to clear out the room, but be wary of pulling Vectus or Marduk. Once the room is clear, you can pull Marduk on his own. Just steer clear of Vectus. Thus, hug the far wall. Face Marduk away from the party, as he'll cleave. Comboed with the damage of a Shadow Bolt volley, this could easily cause a wipe. Marduk passively has a Defiling Aura, which decreases Shadow Resistance by 100. There's no way to avoid this, so just keep this in mind. Marduk's final ability is Shadow Shield, which gives him a Damage Absorb, which returns Shadow Damage. Just fight through this, or purge it if available to your group. Otherwise, Marduk is quite easy on his own. Moving on to Vectus, he's also quite easy, and he's fairly squishy. Spread your group out, as Vectus will periodically place down flame strikes. Run out of the fire if this is placed on you. Vectus's other ability is Blast Wave, which does fire damage around him. If you're able to be out of range, do so to avoid this damage. Otherwise, it's something Melee will have to deal with. Besides that, he's fairly easy. If we go through the further door, we can encounter the Lich, Ras Frost Whisper. All of Ras's damage is Frost. As such, Frost Resistance prevails here, but isn't necessary. Ras loves to stun, especially with his most common ability, Freeze. Freeze will stun everyone in front of Ras for 10 seconds and deal a Frost Damage tick every few seconds. Face him away from the party, or this could be disastrous. Also quite commonly, Ross will use Chill Nova, which knocks everyone around Ross back a very short distance and slows them for quite a bit. Ross will use a Frostbolt Volley. If you see his hands turn blue, interrupt him immediately. Lastly, Ross will Fear. As usual, use Fear Wards or Tremor Totem if available, otherwise to curse. Passively, Ras has Frost Armor, which will slow enemies who attack him by 40% and double their time between attacks. Sorry Mila, you can't really avoid this one. As long as Ras doesn't stun the party with the freeze, he's quite easy. Try not to skip him as he drops plenty of best in slot items. If you're an alchemist and you came for the alchemy lab, it can be found in Ras's room. If we run through the doorway closest to the viewing room entrance, we enter a two-story level of six crypts. Turning right on the upper level, we can enter Instructor Militia's crypt. Clear out the adds in this room. Be wary as the occultists turn into shades, which cannot be damaged by physical attacks. Casters will need to clear these quickly as you won't be able to proceed without killing them off. As for Militia, she's fairly simple. She has two shadow damage over time abilities, Corruption, which just does ticking damage, and Call of the Grave, which will do a large shadow damage tick after 60 seconds. This should be decursed to avoid the burst damage. Militia also has a slew of heals. Interrupt when possible to make the fight slightly easier. Lastly, Militia will cast Slow. This really doesn't affect the fight, and does exactly what you think it does. Militia and the rest of the bosses in the crypts drop quite a few items at a 1% drop rate. There isn't nearly enough screen space to show this, thus I've linked their drops in the description below. Following the crypt around, we can encounter Theolin Krasinov. Theolin is a tank in Spank. He isn't particularly difficult, but he does hit quickly, but not for very high amounts. Theolin's most common ability is Rend dealing a moderate physical damage over time. Thielen will also backhand fairly often, which just stuns the primary target for 2 seconds. At 30% health, Thielen will enrage, causing him to attack 60% quicker. 
Tanks can use a minor defensive here, but the damage shouldn't be more than you could deal with. This fight is quite trivial, so don't let us title scare you. The final room on the upper level holds Polkel and a small army of corpses. Try and keep away from them, as when they die, they do a burst of damage. Polkel himself is incredibly easy as long as you stay spread apart. His most worrisome ability is Volatile Infection. This will release a 500 damage tick around the target. Keep away from this person and cleanse them if you can. This combos with Polkilt's Noxious Catalyst, which reduces nature damage resistance by nearly 100. The tank should be wary of the Lorekeeper's Corrosive Acid as it will reduce your armor by 960, which equates to about 4% more damage taken depending on your armor levels. As long as you stay spread out, this should be an easy fight. Heading down to the bottom level, in the first room to the right, we can encounter the Ravinian. The Slumbering Cadaver has a massive health pool, and will hit your tank quite hard as a Sundering Cleave reduces their armor by a massive amount. The Ravinian needs to be faced away from your party as a Sunder hits everyone in front of him. He also has a normal cleave which just does physical damage in front of him, but it'll probably kill you if you think it's a good idea to stand with the tank. He'll also knock you back, but this shouldn't be concerning if you're facing a wall. Lastly, the Ravinian tramples. This just does minor nature damage around him. It hits for about a thousand, so watch your health, but it shouldn't be too much of an issue. This fight can be a small gear check for the tank and healer, so don't slip up. Next up, we have Alexei Barov and his skeletal guards. Alexei is one of the harder bosses in the dungeon. Nuke his guards down as quickly as possible, as their physical damage is fairly high. As for Alexei, his most worrisome ability is his unholy aura. This will tick for 150 shadow damage every two seconds for the remainder of the fight. The only way to avoid this is to keep your distance from the boss. Tank should bring a Shadow Protection Potion to lessen the damage the healer needs to work through. Paladins also come in handy here, as they have their Shadow Resistance Aura. Even more worrisome is Alexei's Veil of Shadow. This curse reduces the victim's healing received by 75%. If you aren't topped off when you receive this, you're probably dead. This needs to immediately be decursed. If for whatever reason you came in here without someone to decurse, pop your cooldowns. Alexei's final ability is Immolation. This just does minor fire damage over time and is the least concerning of his abilities. Stay focused here and don't rage at your teammates if things go wrong. This is not an easy fight, but with persistence you will persevere. At long last, we have the final crypt with Lady Elusia Barov. Elusia can be a bit of a challenge, but if you beat Alexia you shouldn't have too much trouble. Keep your distance from Elusia as she'll cast a 10 second silence in a pretty large area around her. I'm talking primarily to you, healers. Alusia will also mind control. Crowd control this target to make the fight easier on your party. Alusia's last nuisance spell is Fear. Unless you have a priest to dispel magic, you'll be stuck in this for about 20 seconds. Consider wearing a PvP trinket here to clear the fear unless you're a shaman, hunter, or warrior, as being knocked out of the fight for 20 seconds is quite detrimental. As for her damage abilities, Alusia will just deal a Shadow Shock, which deals a burst of shadow damage, and she also has a Curse of Agony, which will deal a bit over a thousand damage over a period of 24 seconds. Once Alusia has been brought down, school is officially in session. School is in session. Once every boss in the crypt is cleared, Darkmaster Ganling will appear. Positioning is quite important during this fight. You'll want to tank Ganling in the center of the room, and all range should be in the upper levels attacking downwards. Let's cover Ganling's abilities before we hit what really makes him a difficult boss, besides his massive health pool. Ganling will auto-attack fairly hard and cast arcane missiles. When you see his hands glowing, interrupt him to reduce the damage taken. Ganling will also periodically use Curse of the Dark Master. This curse will reduce your health by 500 and your strength by 50. Decurse this if possible, otherwise if you're a warrior, just cry softly into your keyboard. Ganling's final ability is Shadow Shield, which just gives him a bubble absorbing physical and magic damage. What makes this encounter difficult is Ganling's teleport. Every so often, Ganling will send a single party member into one of the rooms around him. The victim will have to fight their way through three mobs to be freed from the room. Healers should have some damaging abilities on their bar to get through this. The mobs aren't incredibly difficult, but can kill players if they're not prepared. If your tank is sent into one of the rooms, the healer should be ready to tap to whoever takes aggro. If your healer gets sent in, someone should off-heal or the tank will need to use cooldowns. 
If you didn't utilize cooldowns in Alexei's room, this is the place to use them. Focus on interrupts and fight your way out of the room as quickly as possible, and that'll be the end of Ganling. Ganling drops a ton of best and slot items, so your efforts will be rewarded. Class dismissed. And that was it for Skolomance. Thanks for watching, and as always, I appreciate your support, and I'll see you in two days once Classic launches.